Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm David Cobb. Thanks for uh, being here this morning for our February uh, science communication webinar. So with that, our presentation today is by David Sawyer. Uh, he probably needs no introduction, but David is uh, one of the assistant chiefs in the wildlife management division, uh, and he oversees the surveys and research program. And today he's going to be presenting on estimating huntable lands in North Carolina, uh, what, why, and how. And so David, thanks for your uh, interest and willingness to do the presentation. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to you and you can share your screen and, uh, and, and move ahead. All right, so this is going to be estimating huntable lands in North Carolina, what, why, and how, and um, I'm hoping this is going to really be a good topic for the series of um, understanding how research informs our uh, conservation and our management. Um, while this topic, uh, estimating huntable lands, really applies to all hunted species, I'm going to do this presentation from the perspective of deer management. And I, th I think the reason, uh, there's a couple reasons, but one of them is that it's, it's the most highly hunted species by our, our hunters in North Carolina. And there's another reason that uh, you'll, it'll become uh, uh, evident later. So just think of this as sort of the story of huntable lands in North Carolina from the perspective of deer management. So to start off, um, so we get on, everybody's on the same page, let's come up with a definition here and huntable lands We'll just say is land having the traits or features permitting hunting and you can think of it as really where hunting occurs so what are those traits and features that permit hunting on a piece of land right off the bat everybody's going to think of, of, of these two the first one is where the animal exists that you desire to hunt so you're not going to go bear hunting where there are no bears and the second one is where it's legal to hunt so let's talk about the legal part this is a map of our current North Carolina deer hunting zones. And so as you can see, um, deer hunting is legal in all counties in the state of North Carolina. Um, and the commission sets the seasons for these for every every single uh, county. And the only place we don't set it is for the Great Smoky Mountain National Park and uh, land that's owned by the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. But what's really the legal huntable area? Um, Let's let's look in focus in on one county, and I'm going to throughout the presentation. I'm going to pick on Durham County. Um, so we know that Durham County is open for deer deer uh, hunting the whole season based on the commission, but how much of it's really not huntable? First, in the first place, we know that most cities have ordinances to prevent discharging weapons, which effectively makes illegal makes it illegal to hunt in, in the city, and Durham is one of those. Um, so first we have to subtract the city area because it's not huntable. And uh, well, deer don't live in the water. And actually, it's not legal in North Carolina to take deer that are standing in water above the knees if you know what the needs of a deer are. So we have to take that out. And a lot of deer do die in the roads, but it's generally not legal to hunt in the roads, so we need to remove them too. So after you remove the cities and the water and the roads, and what's left is what you probably think would be capable of being hunting, hunted. But really, it's not. There's one other important factor, and that's where the landowners permit hunting to occur. If the owner of the land or at least or the leasee of the property, uh, they, they are the ones that dictate whether hunting occurs and how much uh, hunting goes on on the property, how many people are there. So therefore, they control the access to the, most of the state's land area. And that creates um, one more interesting legal situation. Wildlife resources in the United States are legally held under the public trust doc doctrine, but landowners hold the power to restrict access to those resources. So, you know, we all own the wildlife, but landowners completely uh, own the access. Ballot in 2018 provided, um, us, uh, amended the North Carolina Constitution and provided citizens with the right to hunt, but it did not provide them a place to hunt. As a matter of fact, the lang there was language in the amendment that actually clarified that you do not have the right to hunt on somebody's property. We also have the North Carolina Landowner Protection Act. Now, this, this particular uh, law provides some liability protection for landowners that allow hunting on their property, possibly reducing one of the barriers to hunter access on private lands. But on the other hand, it made it easier to post property and enforce trespassing 
uh, for the purpose of hunting and fishing. So now we got an idea of kind of uh, what huntable lands are and who controls the access, but why are they important? I want to first talk about um, implications from the wildlife management uh, aspect. Uh, huntable lands are they're an important denominator in wildlife management. And if you look in this box, uh, just to review basic math, the denominators on the bottom, the numerators on the top, and mostly when we measure uh, wildlife, uh, we're, we have a measurement some number of animals and, and what is the area that, that we're measuring those animals in. It could be fish in a stream, it could be so many fish per mile of, of, of square mile or, or uh, of lake or uh, length of the stream, or it could be deer. And let's look at deer. So if we looked at deer harvest per, per square mile, uh, and we know the number of deer harvested, we would need to know the number of square miles to uh, for what the denominator is for that. And going back to Durham County, last year there were 825 deer reported in the county. But what denominator do we use to figure out what the deer harvest is per square mile? Well, let's go back to the example again. Um, so if we look at the whole county area, we've got 298 square miles. So we've got 298 square miles. Whoop, got feedback. Um, and so at that, that area, using that for the denominator, we've got 825 deer we've got 2.8 deer per square mile. And then if we use the one where we've removed the municipalities, it's a, it's 100 square miles smaller, the huntable area. Then we have a deer density of, uh, a harvest density of 4.5 deer per square mile. And if we take out the water, it even gets a little smaller and we have a higher deer density of 4.7 deer per square mile. So you can see that depending on what we use, it affects the metric that we're managing and in, in, in how we're reporting it. Um, another important aspect to managing deer is, is well, we really, we, we manage deer using opportunity. And the things above that dotted line, are the things that the Wiley Commission controls, we, we, we regulate deer hunting through, or any hunting, through days, days to hunt, season length, days to hunt antlerless deer. The doe uh, segment of the herd is how we really control the population numbers. Uh, the number of deer allowed per hunter, the limit, or what you know, the, the what hunters would say, how many tags they get, um, the season area, uh, which where it is, the zone, what county it is, and then but below that we have below that line we have huntable area, number of hunters, and hunter effort. Well, those are actually controlled by the landowners or the or the leases of the property. And and the one thing I want to point here, if you if if uh, that I want to make sure that everybody gets this point is that. Um, the huntable area, well, to effectively man effectively use hunting to manage a species, we have to have a huntable area. So without huntable area, we cannot effectively use hunting as a management tool. Um, we use hunting to regulate and manage populations, as I mentioned, but what I want to point out here, and these are some pictures of deer around uh, buildings and and the cars is that we were, we would prefer for our deer mortality to to occur in the um, to be caused by hunting rather than by vehicles or some other type of mortality like uh, diseases or even depredation kills those kind of things. So um, our division and the agency we maximize we try to maximize mortality in the hunting category instead of and minimize it in the um, other types of mortality like road road kills it's interesting that the um, that the um, constitution also addressed this it said that public hunting and fishing shall be a preferred means of managing and controlling wildlife so i guess our policy kind of is now in 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 the constitution hunting is also important to people it's 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 part of our history and our culture and um access to land determines whether people can hunt or not the amount and the location of available land determines, as I said, what species can you can hunt, and also the the characteristics of the hunt or the quality of the hunting experience. Uh, for example, if if you're hunting on like five acres, you're you're likely going to sit in the same stand every day, uh, every time you hunt, and and you can't hunt on foot. You're not going to walk around, and you certainly can't use dogs. 2015, we did nine different nine deer hunter forms across the state. We asked those attendees to choose from a list of why, uh, what was the primary reason that they liked the deer hunt, that they hunted. 
And the number one reason they provided at those at those uh, forums was to obtain meat. This uh, bar chart tells you sort of what's been going on with our deer hunters over the last 10 years. It's remaining relatively stable, just under about 250,000, maybe declining a little bit. But what's been going on with the amount of available land to hunt on? I want to walk you through a set of slides that the Silvitz Lab at University of Wisconsin Madison did using um and 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 I and I and these these are looking at data from the US Census Bureau on the average acres per housing unit. And the colors here, as you move up this this uh, toward more purple and red, that's that's more uh, it's less acres per housing unit. So you can sort of just think of that as where the most houses are. OK, and I'm going to flip through 50 years of these just sort of like a little video and we're just going to look at them. So there's 1970. 1980. 1990, 2000, 2010, and 2020. This is projected because the, these people did this project prior to 2020, which was last year. Uh, I'm going to leave this one on there just a second. You can think about where you live or where you hunt or, or where you do anything in the, in the outdoors. And here's 2030. Other researchers have looked at these things, this this uh, this uh, urban land cover and urbanization and this the title. Of this one was interesting The Southern Megalopolis. Um, on the left, what you see is the urban land cover in 2009 and on the right, what you see is projected urban land cover in 2060 with the more red being uh, greater, greater areas. Uh, you can zoom in here at the Piedmont eco region. And you can see that's a very connected urban landscape. It's basically running I-85 all the way down into Georgia. The last couple of maps were projected from extrapolating uh, uh, data. So I wanted to show you that uh, this is the real Census Bureau data. I want to give you some real data to look at. This goes out through 2019. And um, basically since 1970, over this 50 year period, the number of housing units in North Carolina has tripled. Um, I came on board working for the Wildlife Commission in the late 80s, so in my time, it, it is doubled in the time that I've been working for the Wildlife Commission. So one characteristic of the transformation of North Carolina's rural landscape is this process known as parcelization, which is really the division of larger tracts of land into smaller tracts of land. And over, so over time, for various reasons, these parcels continually get divided. Um, as they're split into multiple pieces, the larger parcels decrease in both number and size, and the smaller parcels continue to increase in number and decrease in size. So what this results in is fewer properties available for hunting, and those that are becoming smaller. Uh-oh, I've got a note. Why are we missing Mitchell and New Hanover County? Because when we made this map, it wasn't there. We didn't have data for those two counties. Um, this figure shows where we are today with average parcel size with most North Carolina counties being less than 30 acres. And, if, and really, really, if you get about west of Raleigh, the average parcel size is less than 20 acres in these counties. So we know that parcelization is decreasing the total area available for hunting and the size of the remaining available properties is getting smaller. However, uh, as that occurs, we expect that, that actually there might be a, you might could have a higher hunter density uh, or number of hunters per unit area uh, within the landscape like that. So at first, that, this might not make a lot of sense. So I'm going to I'm going to present a hypothetical example here. So if you focus on the uh, the two green properties there, both of those are the same size. They're both 96 acres. Now I've just hypothetically drawn numbers of hunters. So the, the one on the left has two hunters, and the one on the right has three hunters. So at, at two hunters per 96 acres, we have one hunter per 48 acres. At 300 per 96 acres, we have 100 per 32 acres. So that would be a higher hunter, hunter density. So next, let's look at these two properties up here in the north end. We have one up here of 38 acres with two hunters. So it's 100 per 19 acres. And we have one that's 19 acres with one hunter. So it's also 100 per 19 acres. So in this case, we have two different size properties with the same hunter density. And if you look around the periphery there, you see different different numbers of hunters um, on some really small tracks, a couple down there in the southeast that only have 100 per nine acres. 
if you think about the whole area as one, as, as a biologist might look at it, we've got 283 acres all together, and there's 11 hunters out there. So we have one hunter for 25.7 acres. And, and I want to make clear that, that, that on these properties, the decision of how many people occurs on this landscape and on these individual properties is up to the landowner or the hunters themselves. So, for example, you know, if, I, if I'm hunting on one of on this 96-acre property over here, I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of greedy. I, I I might just want to hunt that with my brother or one other person. So you know, hunt, hunters tend to uh, space themselves out if they can. So if we looked at it as if we pretended like this was one property prior to parcelization, it's it's all it's it's just 57 uh, 100 for 57 acres or 283 acres for the whole area with the 500. I think I may have already said that. Just to give you an idea. What the landscape looks like uh, under there. Um, this is uh, the land cover types. It's forested in, in some open areas, and uh, this is an area that's uh, this in North Durham County, and it certainly has plenty of deer there. I'm sure that there's plenty of hunters in those properties uh, hunting it. So we looked at a couple of landscape level changes that are collectively reducing the huntable landscape and, and appear to be uh, appear to be directly affecting available huntable, huntable lands out there. Um, and I've also told uh, described for you a little bit about why um, measuring huntable lands is important. And and the question was is you know how can we estimate this and, and we really needed an inexpensive and repeatable method some way to use maybe use these indicators that are taking the hunting away uh, to predict the huntable landscape in North Carolina. So uh, what we decided to do was to employ the, the folks there at the, with the wildlife folks at NC State University to build us a model. And this was a project conducted by uh, um, a master's project conducted by Mr. Connor Burke. I'm not going to go real deep into the mechanics of the model and the statistics used, but I think I can give a, a, a it's pretty complicated, but I think I can give a uh, a good overall explanation. So how, how do we do it? Um, so first of all, we need to determine what the major ownership types are on the landscape. Um, we know that there are two, two categories of land ownership that are dictated by law, and we know on those whether hunting occurs or not, one being the municipalities, which we can remove because, because of the ordinances against discharging weapons, and the other being public land, which we know uh, those are national forest properties, state parks, game lands, uh, those kinds of properties. And, and they make up about 11% or a little over 11% of the state's landscape. And we know uh, by, by law or rule whether those are hunted. So we can identify those lands. What we have to do, the remainder and the light, we, we have to estimate that. And there's two uh, basic categories of private ownership there. One would be non-industrial or, or land owned by the private citizens. And you can think of this as individuals or families. And the other one would be industrial industrial category, which is everything else. And think of that like it could be anything, restaurant, churches, timberland corporations, um, some kind of manufacturing facility, any, anything like that. So they used a novel approach to do to do this, and and they adapted uh, a common um, modeling approach in, in wildlife biology, which is species distribution modeling. And the way it works is you obtain known locations of, of for the animal that you're interested in, and you collect data for the conditions around uh, the positive locations where you where you found the animal, and then you predict the animal's occurrence in unknown areas based on the conditions that you found there at the positive sites. And of course, the conditions at the negative sites. So I'm going to um, take a look here at example at whippoorwills, and uh, one of our biologists, uh, um, wildlife diversity biologist, Christine Kelly, a project that she worked on, just to see if I can help explain how this works. So if you look at the the uh, blue squares and the white circles, these are the survey locations. The blue ones are the occupied locations. That's where they found the whippoorwills. And the white ones are where they did not find the whippoorwills. So where you find the whippoorwills, you record the you record the um, conditions there, the habitat conditions and the environmental variables. And then the model predicts over here on the scale the probability that the animal will be located elsewhere across the landscape. With the more red it is, the more likely that we'd find this animal. 
Uh, and in the case of this example, the best predictors of occupancy were elevation, coniferous forest, and the level of human development. So in our project, the first step was to get to get the presence and absence data for the known locations. We use surveys for that, and we sent surveys to uh, mail surveys to the um, non-industrial landowners, the individuals and the families, and we had to t they had to make phone calls to reach the people on the industrial areas to, to so we could get in touch with the person that actually knew about whether uh, hunting occurred on the land or not. Keep in mind that these properties, we knew the way we drew the sample was um, by looking at, we pulled the sample from known parcels. So we knew exactly uh, which parcel that landowner was answering the question for. So that gave us our presence or absence data for exact locations on the, on the North Carolina landscape. Um, we collected the information across the series of about six, well, there's six strata here. And you'll notice that they're real heavy on the small size of the properties. And that was because we thought um, at some point hunting would just drop off, right? At some point, the property sizes would get so small that hunting would either stop or if it did really decline, we wanted to pick up where that happened. This is a dis this is just a picture of where all the surveys came from. Uh, we did get at least one response from every, every, every one of the 100 counties and uh, sample sizes are right over here. So before talking about the model and development of that, I want to look at the results from these survey from the from the sample properties from the actual survey responses. Right off the bat, I want to mention that deer was the number one response for the individual, um, uh, the non-industrial and the industrial properties. Uh, this is a uh, the responses from the um, non-industrial properties here. You can see deer was almost 95 percent. Turkey was about half. Small game was about 60 percent down here. Uh, and if you include the industrial properties, um, deer were hunted on 97 percent of the of the properties. So this 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 whole uh, project and model is very valid for deer. <clears throat> so let's first look at um, let's look at the hunted rate. And this is for uh, let me go over a little bit on this chart. So property size gets larger as you go down. So here's less than one acre and greater than 200 at the bottom. And so this is a non-industrial property. So this would be the uh, individuals and, and families that own this. And as you see, as the properties get larger, the percent of, of those properties hunted gets larger, as you would expect. And industrial properties follow the same trend. Uh, the number's a little bit lower, so the scale's a little bit lower for industrial properties. Um, the interesting thing to me was that you know, while we expected like a real high rate of properties over 200 acres in size, even properties below one acre were hunted and 10% of those properties were hunted. And I mean, if you look, if you look, just look at this, I mean, five to 10 acres size properties, 38% of those properties were hunted and over half of them that were 10 to 20 acres in size. This is the landowner responses for hunter density. Same thing, the properties are getting larger as you go down. Uh, and, but this is the opposite effect. Remember the map that I showed you what we expected. So. As properties are smaller, the hunter density is larger. Now, this is not 2.3 people hunting on less than one acres at one time. These are the, the question on the survey was how many hunters throughout the year uh, do you allow to hunt your property? So it was a, an annual hunter density. Uh, so as you get larger in size, the property get larger, hunter density significantly declines. And these were statistically different. Um, and same thing over in the hunter, uh, the industrial properties, same trend. Again, scale size is a lot is a lot uh, lower. And I'm going to give you a couple vi visual looks with some graphs, just that might be easier for some people to follow. Uh, the property size here across the bottom increases. So as property size gets larger, here's the hunted rate. It's going up, 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 up. This is for the families and individuals. This is the non-industrial. And the hunter density, as properties get larger, it goes down, 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 down. Okay. We, um, 2016, we did a survey of our deer hunters and asked them what the largest private property is that they hunt on. And almost half of them said they, they hunt, the largest property they hunt on is less than 100 acres over here in this category. And less than 25% said they hunted on more than 500 acres out here. And most people were hunting on very, you know, relatively small properties. 
Here's the visual look at the industrial properties. It followed the same trend as property size gets larger across this way. Hunter density declines and hunter rate goes up as property size get larger. Now, what we did see in the industrial properties is right here. Um, the hunted rate was pretty low until you crossed this sort of this threshold of 20 acres. And once you got into this 20 to 200 acre category, it really jumped up. Okay, we're going to talk now about the model development. So, so think back about the whippoorwill example. So what we have, we have the location of every property in a survey. We know if each one of those properties in the survey was hunted or not hunted. And we have map layers for potential geographic predictors. We have, we have, so we have the information. We're going to use map layers off, off of the actual map as our, as our predictors. Um, so the, on the left, you'll see the list of our predictors. Um, and so geographic information system software, or GIS, was used to generate values for road density and housing density at multiple scales. So if this is a property here that said yes or no, it's going out, uh, we're going to go out, I think it was, yeah, it was nine different scales. It started at about uh, just over a tenth of a mile out to nine miles, looking at road density and housing density around each one of these properties. So the final model for each of each of the two property types uses a combination of variables at specific distances that best predicts the answer provided by the landowner. OK, so which prop parcels they say were hunted or not. Well, let's look at the results of the model. It looks kind of complicated. Let's stay on the left side of this line first. This is the non industrial again, individuals and families. And what this plus means is that as property sizes are larger, Obviously, they're more they're they're uh, they're more often hunted. Um, as housing density increases, the hunted rate decreases. As road density increases, the hunted rate decreases, as you might think. And I'll tell you what the distances were for these. Uh, for this best model, it was housing housing density at uh, three tenths of a mile, roughly, and road density out at about one point two five miles, two point five miles. And for the industrial models, the same thing as property size increased, uh, it was, it was the, the percentage went up, the prediction ability went up as um, the likelihood of hunting went up. I'm sorry, as hunting density increased, it was negative. How, as road density increased, it was negative. And distance to the nearest city, this one's kind of interesting. As it increased, it was negative. It's kind of the opposite of what you might think. Uh, we think that might have to do with with uh, some of those properties being larger and closer to cities, and maybe the availability of land. They also tend to be clustered together some of some of those um, industrial areas. So we're not exactly sure why that came out that way, but that was part of the uh, part of the best model. Um, in this case, um, the industrial the housing density was at a distance of seven point five miles, and the road density was at, at three tenths of a mile. The prediction accuracy for that one was 94, and I think I said this one over here was 96% prediction accuracy. Okay, quick review. So on number step one, we collected the sample data. Step two, we used the sample data to collect to develop the models. Now we're at step three. So we take the, the, the models and we're going to add the parcel data for all that land that's not public land and that's not municipal municipalities. And we're going to run that with the model and extrapolate statewide. And I put some smoke on that computer because uh, Connor told me he, he, he couldn't get it to work on the average PC. And he had to go buy a uh, borrow a very high powerful, uh, very powerful computer to do it. Think about it. I mean, he's trying to run like five million properties through this model. So here's our results. Now, this is a little bit of confusing looking graph, but I'm going to look at, just stay with me. and We're going to look at one at a time. So let's start here the private non-industrial group. This is your families and individuals. So 85% of the land in that category, 85.2% was hunted. This category of land makes up just less than 60% of North Carolina's landscape, okay? Over here, this is the private industrial uh, category. 75.5% of that was hunted, and it makes up about, oh, roughly, it looks like about 22% of North Carolina's landscape. We found out that 78.6% of the public lands were hunted. And as I mentioned before, it makes up over 11% of the, of the state's landscape and municipalities are, are considered uh, 
as far as deer are concerned, what we consider those non-hunted. We do have urban archery season. I need to mention that. And there's a handful of counties across the state, state that allow discharge of a, a archery a bow and you can uh, bow hunt. So let's look at a map. This is uh, uh, the map that was after extrapolating across the entire state. This is what it looked like. The green areas are hunted. The dark green areas are the public land. The lighter color green are uh, non-industrial and industrial. So just think of green as huntable and the pink and the reddish stuff is, is, is not hunted. Um, you can see uh, that it's, it's, it's a lot more green out here on the coast. And as you move westward, you're just picking up more and more uh, uh, of the pink and red colors. Uh, 74, let's say 75.4 percent of the landscape was hunted collectively, considering all types. And this data is based on uh, this is based on 2016 uh, parcel data. I want to show you one map here with um, the the land by county. This one this one might even be a better look. Actually, you can really see this goes in 10 percent increments of, of percent huntable. So starting out here. We're, we're at the highest percent huntable in these dark green counties. And when we move westward, we see that it gets less and less and less. Uh, the highest, um, the percent huntable ranged uh, really far, but the highest one in the state was Hyde County which, out, out here, which was 96.8%. The Hyde's a rural county. Um, it's got a really large uh, property size, average property size, and a lot of public land. The the uh, the lowest one was Mecklenburg County, which is is the, the, the county that contains Charlotte, North Carolina, um, and so it was about it was twenty about twenty one percent twenty one point two percent, and so you can see where we can have this for each county, which comes in. That's where uh, the the data it, most of our data for uh, wildlife management is. So we're going to zoom in back again to Durham County and look at that. So here now is the predicted huntable area for Durham County. Um, just right off the bat, you kind of notice it's picking up this sort of this peri-urban or suburban peri-urban zone here. A lot of white there that's not huntable. Uh, and then as you move away from town, it's, it's, it's more huntable. Um, so how do we use this? Back to the example about the square miles. If you remember a while ago, I, 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 I calculated these deer density using these different square miles. And the biggest one we had was 4.7 deer per square mile we were used, we were subtracted out the water in the uh, municipalities. And that was 175 square miles. If we compare now, now we have, with our huntable, using our huntable estimation, we only have 123 square miles and we have a new calculated deer harvest per square mile of 6.7 deer per square mile, almost tiered two deer higher. So you can see what a difference this makes. And, and so you, we, we want our science to be the best that it could be. And we want to describe, when we're describing our populations and where our harvest comes from. We want that to come to be based on the area where the numbers are coming from. And in this case, we base our numbers on, 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 on deer harvest, where the deer harvest comes from. Here's a, a map of, of uh, just a reported, just to show you an example. This is reported antler buck harvest uh, per huntable square mile, um, an average over 2017 to 2019. Um, and there's a lot of examples of where we use this this um, this denominator, but if you look down at the bottom there's screen, uh, uh, John Shaw did a really good, our deer biologist did a really good video on um, managing North Carolina's deer herd and looking at the key metrics. And if you're interested in uh, these kinds of data and graphs, uh, you can uh, go to look at that video. Okay. Hunter density. Connor was able to develop a map of hunter density by extrapolating the number of hunters. The hunter, he extrapolated the hunter density levels from our property sizes, category sizes. If you remember, I showed you those before, onto the predictable ha uh, huntable landscape of the whole land. So, uh, and it was able to make a, com a complete map of it, and we could do this by county or whatever. But when this is done, its property size is really the only geographic variable that you can use to, to effectively predict hunter density. And it really had low predictive power because, it, it, it you know, uh, the hunter density on each property is really dictated by the landowner or the hunters themselves. So it's more of a social uh, parameter. Um, but I do want to show you, I had kind of a gee whiz moment myself when we got to the end of this 
this pr this project and um this is, looks a little confusing but if you think about um back to the discussion that we had a while ago about the, the hunters on the landscape let's pretend this is just hypothetical and and landscapes are not this homogeneous at all but but let's just say we got two pro sets of property here and each one's a square mile so the one on the left is in the rural landscape, okay? And the one on the right, we're going to say, is in a peri-urban landscape, that, that area there between the city and the urban. Um, on the left, we have 1,800 properties with 217 hunters per year. And so there's 461 acres hunted, so 72% of this square mile is being hunted. But on the right, we have 7,600 properties and 196 hunters in a year. And we got only 122 acres hunted or 19% of the area. So, so the interesting thing is how small the area, huntable area is, but how, how many hunters there are on the landscape that you can fit on this landscape. So that was sort of the gee whiz moment for me, making me think that, okay, we may be doing better than I thought we were as far as uh, managing deer in some of these uh, areas where it's more urban. Real quick review about the results of the model. Huntable land can be accurately predicted using only free and public available, publicly available geographic predictors. Um, we can monitor the hunting landscape from a spatial, spatial temporal standpoint. We can look at, you know, over you know, how big it is over time. Uh, we can use it uh, to determine effectiveness of our regulations by understanding more about hunter access to the wildlife resources. Obviously, it improves our the examples I've been showing you improves our population estimates and indices used to monitor game species by, by giving us a more rigorous denominator of where the harvest is actually coming from. Um, and then finally, the hunter density has low predictive power when modeling only with geographic variables. If you're interested in the model building and statistics and want to take a deeper dive into that, uh, we published a couple of papers on this. Uh, one, uh, this one was actually about the method itself in the wildlife society bulletin and there was a second paper published in the human dimension of wildlife which provides um, insight into more about social demo and demographic characteristics how they may affect hunting and this one also contained the hunter density estimation uh, before i forget about it, all these people that are listed on these papers uh, i want to thank all of them for all the work they did on this project it was a, it was a very interesting project and uh, i think very worthwhile Okay, so I want to think of, uh, throw out a few other questions that we might want to consider in the future. And um, one would be, can you know, could we add other land cover types to improve our model? For example, there's a impervious layer that we might use, uh, uh, pavement and uh, building footprints. Um, would it help to add some type of habitat layer, or uh, should we should we try to compare it to a human density, uh, especially around municipalities? At, at one point, we actually used two acres two people per acre, sort of a seat of the pants uh, um, geographic variable to use to try to estimate what our huntable lands were. Um, and, can, you know, I think we need further ground truthing, and especially in the more urban zones. Another question is, can we calibrate this to better estimate huntable lands for other species? For example, um, geese. Um, the, the, Geese are a nuisance problem uh, in, in suburban areas and urban areas, and generally, not always, but a lot of times you hunt around water, but you certainly hunt with a shotgun, so you're going to discharge a weapon up in the air, so that that that, that might be a, a real issue, right? In small properties, you might not be able to do that. Um, animals like rabbits or quail, generally you hunt those with dogs, so we may, we might, could we calibrate huntable lands for for these species, uh, where where you would use dogs, uh, you can't certainly can't release dogs on four or five acres of land and hunt rabbits there. Um, and then turkeys, um, you know, turkeys, turkeys they they um, turkey hunters usually hunt on large properties and they tend to move a, a lot, so uh, it's really hard to hunt turkeys on on small properties. So, a huntable landscape for turkeys actually might be a lot smaller than what we're what we're estimating for deer. I want to focus in on just some deer management questions back just specifically on deer before we wind this up. Um, and so, you know, what's the hunter effort where huntable land and non-huntable land are intermingled? And we're going to look at a, a map or two in a minute and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, 
Are our regulations effective in suburban zones? Um, does baiting have an effect on that, where those, where those properties are, are intermi intermingled like that? Um, and then finally, uh, this one is interesting to me. What is the probability of harvest of a deer as a home range encompassing both huntable and non-huntable parcels? So, so if you got a, a deer on the landscape, and we're going to look at a picture of the, where it contains both of these, and some of these areas are sanctuaries, and some of them are, are hunted. So how does that really affect the, the likelihood of a deer being taken? And, and by saying that, I know what's going through some people's mind is that I've got to acknowledge something. For deer, we do know that the, the hunted population exists on an area larger than the calculated huntable area, right? Because of what I just said. So therefore, we may be underestimating the huntable hunt, the landscape from which the harvest actually comes. We're not we're not underestimating the landscape where where the animals are taken. But but what I mean is we're we're underestimating the landscape where the animals live that were, that were taken from the huntable land, uh, or possibly well you know we could be overestimating it. I still think this is the best thing we can we can, we've got. But let's look at um. As um, well, you just look at this area here north of Durham, and this is what I'm talking about as far as intermingling these two types of uh, land, the municipalities in red, the huntables in green, and the non-huntables in the pink. So if you think about that, um, you know what's going on there? Are, are, are our regulations working? Um, are they are they are they taking care of all the deer that live on both 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 areas uh, with our with our hunters that are hunting in high densities in the small areas? We look at this diagram. Um, I put some circles on it. These, these circles are five. Oh, that's a feedback. That's a feedback. These circles are five. I got feedback. Somebody got their mic on. These circles are 500 acres each. So I was pretending like, uh, let's just pretend that that 500 acres is a deer home range. Uh, in the in the rural landscape out here, it might be a good a good um, estimate of a of a deer home range. Uh, this box is one square mile. We typically measure deer density in square miles. So in the rural landscape like this up here, we would consider a uh, deer density of 35 to 50 deer square mile to be something that we might see. So there could be 35 to 50 deer square deer living in a in an area that size or, or a lot of deer living in one of these circles. But if a deer home range is like this and it encompasses both of these areas, you know, what's going on? What's the probability that deer might be seen or taken? And then what's going on down here in these areas with deer? Um, let's look at one of those just a little closer. Let's look at this one right here. Mostly it's just showing to be in city or not huntable. It looks like there, something came up as green. I'm going to zoom in on that. Um, this is an aerial photo of, of that very circle. And if you look at it, you can see there's a whole, there's a lot of houses, houses there. There's high housing density, but there's a lot of, lot of cover and land in there where deer could be. And we all know how well deer are doing in these suburban uh, areas. I, I actually once saw a, a, a doe have a fawn right outside of the uh, the Raleigh office building or wildlife building. Um, but why are people not hunting there? Why is that marked as not not huntable? And this is the reason. These are the parcels on in that circle. And just for uh, reference, that per, that property right there in blue, that's one acre. And these parcels here are or 0.55, so they're just over a half an acre each. Now, I'm, you know, I'm sure some people may own more than one par parcel, but if you can imagine trying to deer hunt in one of these areas like this on one of these parcels, it would be very difficult. Uh, you're probably going to have some issues. Uh, while this presentation has really been about the effects of urbanization and parcelization on land, available for hunting, that for huntable lands, I really must note that these landscape changes are affected, have a tremendous effects on our other, on uh, the available land and habitats for all of our wildlife species. So I really wanted to, I really wanted to make that comment. Um, and that similar techniques could probably be used to look at, um, uh, you know, the existence of these certain species depending on uh, the, the amount of urbanization. And, Dr. Cobb, that's all I have. All right, thanks, David. Great presentation. I appreciate that. You, uh, as you and I have talked about for a long time, this is a really cool project. Has a lot of useful information, uh, not only for for deer and other game management, but as you pointed out, 
uh, at the end implications for a lot of non-game management. So, so with that, uh, I'll say thanks to everybody. I hope you have a good rest of your day and everybody stay, stay safe. Thanks. See you.